only philosophy of closing the deficit, keeping in mind that many of those cuts will hit people in Dixon very hard. I pulled some IRS data today, and over half of all the income taxes filed in the 95620 area code are under 50,000. So if you do support a cuts only budget, what would you cut and what effect is that going to have for the people of Dixon? Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> the number one reason why you're going to vote for me as your congressman is because I'm going to Washington to balance our budget. This trillion dollar borrowing every year has got to stop. Now, cuts only, no. We have to grow revenue and cut spending. But we grow revenue by growing jobs, not growing taxes. But I will, in reference to your question, say that there's a whole lot of tax loopholes we addressed earlier in the conversation today at the rich that we need to get rid of. We need to simplify our tax code. Take care, take those out. Over the summer when the uh, Republican Congress, and here I'm Republican, remember? They were saying, we're not going to have any increases in revenue. We're going to do cuts only. And the PR geniuses on the Democratic Party came out with that. Uh, commercials for one granny off the cliff in the wheelchair because those big, bad Republicans only want to hurt you by cutting. And then they came out with this tax incentive for corporate jets saying, give us that at least for compromise. I would have said, yes, let's do that. Because my conservative principles want to take down some of the complexities of our tax code, make it a level playing field. That's conservative principle. That would have allowed us to work together to come together and try to figure this out in a balanced approach. Raising taxes is just the government admitting we failed to spend your money wisely and to live within our means. Responsible government is spending the money we're bringing in and having tax codes and balanced approaches that work. We don't need higher taxes, we need higher revenue, absolutely, by getting the government off the backs of job creators to get more people going to work and paying taxes. We need to get rid of the tax loopholes for revenue increases that favor one industry or a person over another. And we need to do a lot of spending cuts. We've got so many programs that we just shouldn't be spending your money on because it's irresponsible. Balanced approach, absolutely, and that's my definition of it. Me? Yep. Yes, sir. Cuts only. First of all, you can't you can't tax your way to success. So I like the idea of cutting taxes. At the same time, I like the idea of closing some of the loopholes on the IRS. The IRS doesn't have 20,000 pages. The IRS ranks at 75,000 pages. The CEO of GE, who's like the top jobs guy or something for President Obama, John explained how GE hasn't paid in taxes the last what, two or three years, for a very small amount. They've outsourced, this is a guy in charge of jobs for America, has outsourced over a million jobs in the last 10 years. But in the same three or four years that they didn't pay taxes, they paid $84 million to lobbyists to help create tax situations for the federal government so they don't have to pay taxes. Does that make any sense? No. Are there areas to cut? Yes, there are. The Department of Energy, John, uh, President Carter in 1977 created the Department of Energy to stop or to take to lessen our dependence on foreign oil. At that time, we had 30 34 percent of our oil from foreign source. 35 years later, there are now 18,000 federal employees in the Department of Energy, 100,000 contracted employees. It costs billions and billions of dollars a year to operate, and we get 70 percent of our oil from foreign sources. Yeah, there's definitely some places we can cut back. Thanks. Education, <coughs> research, infrastructure, national defense. Where are you going to cut? Where are you going to cut? Social welfare programs, Medicare, Social Security. Where are you going to cut? There's no way to deal with the deficit in a cuts-only proposal. Last summer, I voted for $4 trillion of deficit reduction. It was a balanced approach. Those people that have had an enormous tax break for the last 12 years, out of fairness to America, to America's seniors, ought to be paying their fair share. Middle class has taken the hammer 
to its pocketbook over the last 12 years. We've reduced the taxes on the middle class. We need to keep those taxes low. The wealthy have enjoyed incredible, incredible wealth, and they've seen their wealth grow. The proposal that passed the House of Representatives less than two weeks ago was, then, was a proposal that would reduce taxes on the wealthy, million dollar a year income and above, by over $394,000 a year. And the only way to make that up would be through the process of eliminating the homeowner's deduction and other deductions that the middle class depends upon. It was a grossly unfair tax proposal, and I voted against it, as did all my Democratic colleagues. Serious reductions in Medicare, the termination of Medicare was in that bill. $810 billion reduction in Medicaid, and that, 60% of that goes to nursing homes. And those are the seniors that are in nursing homes, they have no other way to pay for it. There's no way to deal with the deficit with the cuts only budget. We need to increase jobs in this country to increase revenue. We don't have to tax ourselves to death to create revenue. We have to get the job generators in this country the freedom to create jobs and grow the economy. Cuts do need to take place. We need to shrink the size and the scope of the federal government. And along with that comes cuts. At the same time, we need to get out of the way of the job creators. That, in and of itself, will raise revenue. Then we have the taxing structure discussion. But those are the two most important items, and job creation being the first, to adding revenue to this deficit situation. Creating jobs, increasing revenue, and keeping the jobs we have. 800 million job loss, that's why we have a reduction in the tax roll, because of loss of jobs. That's why the middle class is being hit. We've heard several times tonight the beating that the middle class has taken. It's not because of the taxes, it's because of the loss of jobs. The reason why you can't make your payment, or I can't make my payment, is because my job has been cut in half. My job was dramatically reduced over the past five years. That's not because of a taxing issue, that's because of an economy issue where we're shrinking our private sector jobs and growing our government jobs. How we get this back on track and how we get the revenue in is by creating jobs and increasing the revenue for the ones we have. We have time for one more short question and then we'll have final remarks. So there's one person, the gentleman in the front there. I've heard the word fair thrown around quite a bit up here, uh, especially from our friend Mr. Garamendi. I'd like to know what his definition of fair is. How much of my money is it fair for the government to take? And I'd like a specific answer. What's fair? Thank you. But that's for all of us, right? Sure. Okay. It is not fair to cut the money that parents need to get care in a nursing home. That's not fair. It's not fair to take Medicare that we depend upon for our seniors to be able to get health care that has literally taken them out of poverty over the last 40 years and destroy that program. That is not fair. It is not fair to allow the oil companies to continue to take $5 billion a year of your tax money on top of what they are charging us at the pump while they are exporting 26 million gallons of gasoline a day. That's not fair to take your tax money and give it to the big five oil companies. That's not fair. 
It's not fair to put a bill out of the House of Representatives that would hold down the middle class and take away their deductions that they depend upon, literally increasing their taxes. That's not fair. It is not fair to put in place and to put on the agenda a tax bill that would give millionaires a 35% reduction in their taxes while pushing the burden off to the middle class and to the poor. That's not fair. But that's precisely what happened less than two weeks ago in the House of Representatives. Fairness is a tax policy that is a graduated progressive income tax system. So that those people that have great wealth and have acquired even greater wealth, so much so that in the last 20 years we have seen the greatest disparity of income between the super wealthy and the rest of the people. Never, only once before in American's history, have we seen this kind of dichotomy between the top few and the many at the bottom. I'll tell you what FAIR is. A FAIR is a tax system that takes those that have a great and gives them the opportunity to help all of us. Okay. In the Congressman's defense, it's, hard, it's tough to solve these problems in two minutes. Now, I'm going to go back just one moment about where to cut. Where to cut. I've got a whole list of things. Three million dollars, somebody in our government signed off so a University of Irvine could play video games. Three million dollars of your tax money. VA, can we cut the VA? I'm a vet. VA spent 175 million dollars on uh, buildings they didn't use, including an octagon monkey cage in Dayton, Ohio. We can cut, okay? Not enough for you, 175 million. How about 20 billion? overall in the federal government on properties we don't use. Let's go through that and stop spending the money. Not enough for you. How about $100 billion in waste in Medicare? I've got a press release by the Democratic Congressional Committee saying that I want to end Medicare. Last night I said very publicly, I'll say it again, I want to save Medicare for our people. We do it by getting rid of the waste $100 billion. There's areas to cut in our federal government and a lot of them. What's fair? 17% of the federal government 17% of our GNP to fund our federal government. That's a specific number that I would like to see. No more burden than that. But we got to add about 3% to pay off the $15 trillion, $20 trillion by the time we turn it around to pay off our debt. And then as we get rid of these loopholes, as we get rid of uh, a lot of these tax incentives that favor the rich, so-called rich, about 25% is the max I'd like to see anybody paying out of their pocket for federal uh, in, uh, taxes. Okay, and one more point before I let you go. He keep, our congressman keeps talking about this disparity. Remember, I grew up poor. I am a Christian today because somebody knocked on my door and offered me a hamburger from McDonald's if I would come to church. That was special back then. Our poor go to McDonald's all the time. They've got cell phones, they've got TVs, they've got cars. All boats have lifted in this country. That's what America's about. The redistribution of wealth, taking from the wealthiest to make sure <coughs> the rest of us have an opportunity, is not fairness. If you and I were in that position, in that 1%, we wouldn't be advocating for our wealth to be distributed. We don't need to chop the existing pie up into smaller pieces for the sake of fairness. We need to grow the pie larger so that we all have the opportunity to succeed and be that 1%. We live in the greatest country in the world. People flock to this country for the opportunity to be in that 1%, because we still have that opportunity. If I work hard and am innovative and decide what path I want to follow in life, I can be that 1% someday. I don't have to expect someone to give me something to be in that 1%. It's my responsibility to take care of myself and take chances to be in that 1%. I don't need it redistributed to me to make that happen.
you know, fair is an interesting question. What if you just sat down and said, okay, this family has two kids, this family has two kids, they both go to the same public school, they both drive on the same public streets, they're protected by the same fire department, the same police department, the same military. Why don't we take the cost of all the expenses, just divide it up by the number of people, and everybody pays their fair share? Is that fair? 60%, we know that that doesn't work because there are folks that are struggling to make, you know, to make ends meet. So we know that we're going to have to work some sort of graduated system. But when the top 10% of the wage earners pay 60% of the federal income tax and the bottom 47% of the wage earners pay no federal income tax, then we have a problem. I forget which Greek philosopher it was, or Greek, uh, I think it was a philosopher, a couple thousand years before the birth of Christ said when, and I was surprised when I read this quote and found out I came from a Greek philosopher 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. When the bottom half that doesn't pay taxes finds out they get to vote on how much the top half that does pay taxes has to pay, your nation is not long for its life. Margaret Thatcher said, the problem with socialism is sooner or later you run out of other people's money. You can't continue to build a country larger and larger. <coughs> the government doesn't have any money. The government doesn't make any money. The only money that the government has is the money it takes from its citizens in taxes. As the government expands, they talk about government creating jobs. The government shouldn't be creating jobs. The government should get out of the way and let Americans create jobs. That's what they do well. And they do it for a lot less money, and they're much more efficient at it. As the government gets larger, and the tax-paying base gets smaller, it ultimately gets to the point where the weight will crush it. That's what you're seeing right now in Europe. We know that we're going that direction. Do we want to keep going the same direction? Does that make any sense? Not if we see it happen. That'd just be silly. <coughs> okay, this ends the uh, question and answer period. Our time's up. We'll now have closing remarks by each candidate. They're limited to three minutes, and the speaking order is the reverse <coughs> of that of the opening remarks. So, John, your first part. Oh, we didn't finish that. I'm saying, we went first at the beginning. I did. Good. Okay, so that was two. Pardon? So, John, which John's first? Yeah. Right. Got a very moment there for a second. I want to thank all of you for being here and for those that are watching this on television. We're all involved in an extremely important process, the process of selecting the path that America is going to go on in the future. When I started this, I, I knew years ago that my involvement could make a difference. And over the years, I think it has. You see a very different uh, way of approaching the problems here tonight. But as I said at the very outset, this is a wonderful country. This is a country with enormous potential. And how we unlock that potential is the task that all of us face. Tax policy is a piece of it. And let me remind you that every wage earner, every wage earner pays 8.5% of their wages in taxes. Not in income taxes, but in Social Security and Medicare. It's a promise that this nation made to each other that we would provide that basic benefit when a person retired. And we would provide every senior in this nation with an opportunity for decent health care. And we've done it. Over the years we will change and we will improve Medicare. But I will tell you this, I will fight as long as I'm in public policy to make certain that Medicare and Social Security are there for those people that work so hard to make this nation what it is. It's what we owe them. And we owe our children that education. It doesn't come cheap. And we must debate how we're going to do it but we're going to have to pay for it. And those who have so much <coughs> ought to be participating in fairness in this process of paying for those services. We've not discussed many, many issues here. We've not discussed how the budget that was the appropriate the budget that was passed just less than two weeks ago would eliminate more than four million jobs within the next 18 months. That's not fair, but that's what it would do doesn't provide the money for infrastructure, doesn't provide the money for education, actually reduces the Pell Grants and doubles the interest rate on every student loan immediately. That's not fair. 
Fairness is seen in a different way. We have to seek fairness, but we also have to invest in those things that create economic growth. Education, research, and by the way, that budget reduces agricultural research, energy research, and medical research. That's not fair. That's not wise public policy, but that's what it does. And it increases the deficit by $4 trillion and never in the next 30 years would it ever achieve a balanced budget. That's not fair. So let's be wise about this. We need a more balanced approach. Cuts are possible. Cuts have been made. I voted for $4 trillion of deficit reduction less than nine months ago. I thank you for this evening. It's a great joy and a great pleasure and an honor to be your congressman. And I'd like to continue that task. They controlled the House, the Senate, the Presidency. 
They could do anything they want, they could pass anything they want. Did they solve the problems then? Just think about it. We have a choice right now to either be going the European style, big government, big entitlements, big taxes, which leads to mediocrity, bankruptcy, and steals the nation's future, its creativity, and its fire. Or are we going to become just, just another once great civilization in the history books? Or are we going to take the opportunity of a lifetime to get America back on track and going and moving forward again? America has accomplished more in 300 years than all the other nations and civilizations in the history of the world combined. We've done more good for more people than any other nation in history. Every time there's a problem or a major catastrophe in, in the world, who do they call and ask for help? Even the countries that don't like us, who do they call and ask for help? And what do we do? We go and help them. And then when they're weak and vulnerable, we can take over that country. I love American imperialism. We can take over that country, do we? No. We put them back on their feet and we come back home. We watch baseball on TV and go watch our kids play soccer. Because that's all we want to do. We don't want to take over the world. This is the kind of America. If we make the right decisions right now, we can see progress and achievement in the next 300 years because of the base that we've developed. Look at the progress we've made the last 100 years. In the next 300 years, we can make progress that's beyond even our own imagination. We're doing things today that 100 years ago, Helen hasn't voted in 30 years. She registered to vote. She's 95. She registered to vote, so she come vote for me. Got my t-shirt and everything. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> if my positive attitude and problem-solving approach is the way that you would like to see your government running, then I would greatly appreciate the honor of representing in Washington. I'm not going there to fight. I'm going there to find, to solve problems, find areas of agreement, and then build solutions. I believe that most of the folks back there honestly want to do the best they can for the country. And I find that when you lay out solutions to problems, you find that there's the far left and the far right, but most people just settle left or right of center. And they're amazed to find out how much they actually agree on. Thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight and paying attention. This has been great. I really do love this stuff. Uh, I alluded to it earlier, and I want to make this point and get it out of the way right now. About Amber Moon, the Democratic Campaign Congressional Committee was the source of that misquote of what I said about Medicare. And I want to make sure that if you hear anything from somebody other than me or my campaign that come to the source, because the congressman and I disagree on enough about issues that we certainly don't need to make up stuff about each other. And I will say that Congressman Garamendi has been nothing but a gentleman in this race. And I do not blame him for that whatsoever. And, uh, but uh, we don't always control our surrogates. So I just want you to know, when you hear something about me, come to me, ask me, I'll let you know before you let that go. All right, now tonight, I've told you some very specific examples about some of the solutions that I want to see for this country, giving you an idea of what kind of representative I'll be for you and how I will go about fixing things. I mean, my entire military career, my entire adult life, all I've been is about solving problems the best way possible for my unit, for my crew, for my team, and I want to do that for Americans in general. The future is bright, ladies and gentlemen. It is bright, but we have a window right now and we have a choice to make. The last great generation of this country was the World War II generation that sacrificed and won that war for us to make sure the American dream was there for us. And it has lasted a long time. We have all benefited from their sacrifice. Well, thank God tonight, our sacrifice isn't a war we face where our brave men and women are dying for us. It's a war against debt. It's a war against too large a government. It's a war against too much control of government. And yes, this future for our country, in my eyes, my vision for us, does ask pretty much every corner of our country as a national movement, what are they going to sacrifice in terms of their dependency on government to make sure that American dream is there for our kids and our grandkids. It is our time now, ladies and gentlemen. It is our time now to be those Americans that do what it takes to make sure the next generation has it better off than us. And our fight is looking at how much we rely on government and how much it does for us instead of what the Constitution founded in this country to make it the greatest nation in the history of humankind. 
And that's individual responsibility. Opportunity for us to succeed. My solutions are wrapped up in common sense, conservative, smaller government, not bigger, and constitution. Based on that. That's what I will do as your congressman. That's what I look forward to do serving you. Thank you so much for tonight. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.